Hello and welcome to Drama Recaps. Today, we're diving deep into the 2011 American sci-fi drama film, In Time. Spoilers ahead. Our protagonist is Will, a man residing in the impoverished area of Dayton City, where every resident begins each day with just 24 hours to live. One day, Will wakes up and meets his mother, Rachel, downstairs. Despite Rachel celebrating her 50th birthday, she appears no older than 25, the age when aging stops in their world. Rachel confides in Will that she has only three days remaining on her life clock and she must spend them working at a garment factory to pay off their debts and electricity bill. Will suggests fighting as a means of earning more time, but Rachel vehemently opposes the idea, not wanting him to follow in his father's footsteps. She urges Will to meet her at the bus station after three days, to which he agrees. Before he leaves for work, she generously gives him some extra time for a meal. On his way to work, he meets a girl named Maya and kindly gives her five minutes of his time. Later, Will meets his friend, Borel, for coffee and they are taken aback by the price hike. At the factory, they witness a deceased worker, whom Will suggests died due to time running out. That night, Will is denied extra time at work. He heads to a local bar, where Borel is heavily intoxicated. At the bar, they encounter a wealthy man named Henry who is footing everyone's drink bill. When Fortis and his time-thieving gang show up, chaos ensues. Everyone starts to leave, including Will and Borel. However, Will decides to stay back to observe the situation. Henry, cornered by Fortis and his gang, agrees to surrender his time but requests to use the restroom first. As Fortis's henchman follows Henry, Will seizes the opportunity to save Henry by knocking the henchman out and escaping with Henry to an abandoned building. In their hideout, Will queries Henry about his presence in Dayton City, suggesting that with his wealth, he should be residing in the affluent neighborhood of Greenwich. Henry doesn't address Will's question directly but instead shares a profound truth, there is enough time for everyone in the world, but the wealthy hoarded, inflating prices to ensure the poor perish. Despite his 105 years and a century left on his timer, Henry admits he has grown weary of eternal life. After sharing drinks and stories into the night, Will awakens the next morning to discover Henry has transferred his entire time reserved to him, leaving Henry with only moments left on his own clock. Finding Henry on a bridge, Will can only watch as time runs out and Henry passes away. Brimming with newfound wealth, Will visits Borel, gifting him a decade's worth of time, a year for each of their years of friendship. Borel suggests Will leave Dayton City, given his new affluent status. Will decides to relocate to Greenwich with his mother once she finishes her workday. Meanwhile, Rachel manages to pay off their debts and heads to the bus stop, only to discover that the ticket price has risen. It now costs her two hours of her life for a journey home. Desperate and with only 90 minutes on her timer, Rachel embarks on a two-hour journey home on foot, begging for assistance from those she encounters, but to no avail. Simultaneously, Will reaches the bus station with a bouquet for his mother, only to find she hasn't arrived. Understanding his mother's dire situation, Will frantically searches for her, finally locating her just as her time runs out. Despite his new wealth of time, Will is helpless to save his mother, who dies in his arms. The next morning, timekeeper Elian recovers Henry's body. Noticing that Henry's timer is completely depleted, Elian speculates that he may have been murdered, considering the desperate lengths people in Dayton City would go to for a few extra minutes. In the aftermath, Will heads to Greenwich, vowing to make the city's affluent inhabitants pay for their exploitation of the poor. Crossing multiple time zones, which serve as borders between cities, Will's journey to Greenwich does not go unnoticed by the timekeepers. They are alerted to the unusual movement across these zones. Exiting the vehicle, Will starts running, attracting the attention of a woman named Sylvia. He checks into an upscale hotel, spending the night in luxury. The next morning, he appreciates the luxury of having plenty of time, and heads to a hotel for a fast meal. The waitress informs him that his meal is worth eight weeks of time. Surprised, but not deterred, he pays and tips her. She questions his origins, given his haste, which is not typical of Greenwich residents. He tells her he's from Dayton City and inquires about a nearby casino. 
Will, now dressed appropriately for a high-stakes venue, finds himself opposite an elderly man in the casino who gambles a century of time. Matching the bet with his own time, Will surprisingly wins, claiming the entire pot. The defeated man turns out to be Sylvia's father. Sylvia and Will meet, and she extends an invitation to a party at their residence. At the party, Sylvia's father introduces Will to his wife and mother, who look strikingly similar to Sylvia due to the age freezing mechanism. They share a dance, and Will encourages Sylvia to join him for a swim in the ocean. Their playful swim is cut short when Sylvia's father calls them back inside. As they prepare for another round of poker, the timekeepers burst into the mansion, arresting Will. Despite explaining that his wealth of time was gifted to him by Henry Hamilton, the timekeepers seize his time, leaving him with a mere two hours. In a desperate act, Will subdues the timekeepers, takes Sylvia hostage, and they escape in his car. On the run, Will tries to help Sylvia understand the harsh realities of Dayton City, the time poverty and the senseless deaths due to lack of time. Their conversation is cut short when a trap laid by Fortis and his gang of time thieves causes them to crash. As they lose consciousness, the thieves rob them of their time, leaving when the sound of police sirens fill the air. When Will regains consciousness, he finds himself running perilously low on time. He hauls Sylvia to his friend Borel's home, where Borel's wife informs them that Borel used the time given to him by Will to purchase alcohol, and subsequently died. They receive no aid and are left with Sylvia's valuable earrings, which Will manages to pawn in return for two days' worth of time. Witnessing the desperate conditions of Dayton City, Sylvia is deeply moved. They take shelter at Will's place, waiting for the next day to see if Sylvia's father would send them time. However, the next morning brings no aid from her father. Will encourages Sylvia to contact her father for their safety. As Sylvia is making the call, timekeeper Ray bursts in, attacking Will. Sylvia responds by shooting at Ray, providing a window of escape for them. As they flee, Will unexpectedly transfers some time to Ray, explaining to a confused Sylvia that Ray would have died before the arrival of other timekeepers. Back in Greenwich, Ray encounters Sylvia's father, who pleads with him not to blame Sylvia for their situation. Ray retorts that Sylvia is as implicated as Will, and that her father's protection cannot extend to her now. Despite Will's advice to separate for her safety, Sylvia chooses to stay with him, revealing a plan that could aid the residents of Dayton City. She suggests robbing her father's time bank, which is filled with time capsules. Acting on her plan, they crash a truck into the bank and successfully distribute the stolen time among the poor. Witnessing his daughter's actions, Sylvia's father begins to understand her alliance with Will. The pair retreat to a hotel room where they share a playful round of poker. Their peace is disrupted by the arrival of Ray, prompting them to make a hasty escape by jumping out of the window and eluding the timekeepers on a bus. In another part of town, the time thieves attack residents, offering a decade's worth of time as a reward for information on Will and Sylvia's location. Their location is betrayed, and the thieves storm their hotel, taking Sylvia hostage. A tense arm wrestling match ensues between Will and Fortis, the gang leader. Will cunningly drains all of Fortis's time, leaving him with mere seconds to live. He seizes his gun and eliminates the rest of the time thieves. Having survived this perilous encounter, Will and Sylvia make their escape from the hotel. Will and Sylvia observe that the loan rates have surged. Will points out to Sylvia that Greenwich's elite are essentially exploiting Dayton's people by selling time at inflated interest rates. This inspires Sylvia to formulate a new scheme. She decides to confront her father, feigning capitulation. Meanwhile, Will, camouflaged as one of her father's guards, threatens her father with a gun. They compel him to reveal his vault, inside which they discover a time capsule storing more than a million years of time. Seizing this wealth, they retreat to Dayton. In the meantime, the timekeepers get wind of the stolen capsule, and Ray commences yet another pursuit. He rams into their car, but before he can capture them, Will hands off the capsule to a woman named Maya, instructing her to distribute the time among the masses. This act instigates turmoil, allowing Sylvia and Will to evade capture. Ray trails them and finally corners them. With only seconds left on his own timer, 
He confesses that he hails from Dayton too, but he can't permit their time redistribution as it would undermine the existing system. Soon after, Ray's timer hits zero and he collapses dead. Witnessing the downfall of the system, Dayton's populace began to migrate towards Greenwich. In this new reality, even the timekeepers abandon their posts. The film concludes with Sylvia and Will, readying themselves to raid another time bank. This is the end of the movie, let me know what you think about this movie in the comments, and subscribe to the channel so as not to miss the release of new content, thanks for watching.